Hey guys, welcome to the first session of the new Middle East, understanding the center of the earth at the crossroads of history. I'm Dalton Thomas here in the lovely Golan Heights of Northern Israel on the Syrian border and here with my uh, good friend Joel Richardson in the first, we're calling this a limited series. So we're, we're thinking this will probably be about 20 sessions long and what we're going to be doing is jumping into exploring the new emerging Middle East from a bunch of different angles. We've got a really amazing lineup of people from, from the uh, missions world, people from the background in military and intelligence, people in business, um, strategic thinking, um, and people who just love the Middle East and love different areas of the Middle East. And our goal over these next 20 or so sessions is really to fan the flames of uh, passion and conviction concerning the Lord's purposes in the Middle East, that we would uh, fall in love with what the Lord loves in the Middle East of what he's doing right now. I think it's, a, it's an amazing time to be alive. And I think there's a lot going on right now in the Middle East. And so there's, before we jump into it, there's uh, two, two things to make mention of. If you don't already have it, go download the FAI app. It's available on all major app stores. We're going to be putting these sessions up on the app first. So if you want to get these first, you'll get them. There'll be push notifications. It'll let you know as soon as it goes up. So just download the app and turn on push notifications, which is also important because some of you may have noticed that we've been somewhat uh, quiet over the last few months where we were you know, pumping out a lot of Bible studies and content. And then it kind of tapered off there for a little while. The reason is because we've been deep in post-production on a film that's now done. In fact, last week, last night, we watched the final version of the film. So we're now in the polishing mastering stage and we're excited to release it and to, and to announce it. So make sure you get the app because all of the announcements are going to hit the app first. These will also go up on the wire podcast as audio, and they'll also go up on YouTube as well, these videos. And uh, the second thing is that one of the reasons we're doing it in this format is because I am in lockdown in Israel. Israel right now is during the high holidays and uh, Sukkot is just about to begin. Yom Kippur just happened and we're uh, in a very bizarre moment of history in, in Israel and in the Middle East, obviously. But in Israel, I'm here in my little neighborhood. I live in a a uh, small community up in the Golan Heights. My house, actually, you can see Lebanon. Um, you can see Syria. And if it wasn't for a ridge line, you could see Jordan as well. We can also see the Sea of Galilee. So we're in a very awesome place of the earth. And so the other angle that we're taking with looking at this new Middle East is the conviction that we have as a spiritual family at FAI that looking at the Middle East through Israel-centric eyes is very important at this moment of history. It's not just an issue of understanding the Middle East, but understanding the Middle East through an Israel-centric uh, uh, Israel centric eyes, meaning we understand the role of Israel and God's purposes on the earth in this generation, historically, past, present, and future. So that's a big part of what we're going to be looking at, is, is, is looking at the Middle East from the vantage point. And, and symbolically, from this little ridge line of the Golan, which is kind of FAI's operating headquarters, center of gravity for Israel, but also the Middle East, you can literally see the Middle East from this little plateau, the Golan Heights. And I think it's metaphorically speaking, what we're wanting to call the nations to over the next 20, 30 days or so is to look at and do a deep dive into understanding what's taking place in the Middle East. And so in this first session, I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to be interviewing uh, in every session. I'll be interviewing someone different. Sometimes we'll have a couple sessions with Joel, a couple sessions um, with a couple double ups with people that are, you know, Joel can't be reserved to just one session. We're going to have to hit a couple sessions. Um, we've got some, uh, an amazing lineup of people. I'm just going to basically going to be introducing you to some of my favorite people in the world who are either experts or who have been serving in these different countries or regions in the Middle East for a very long time and have a lot of insight that you're not going to hear from the news, even good news outlets, you're still not going to hear this stuff. And so I think that um, it's going to be a very valuable, uh, very valuable month to go deep in understanding the Middle East, but not just on a geopolitical. Sometimes we're going to talk geopolitics. Some days we're going to talk prophecy. Some days we're going to talk missiology. Some days we're going to talk personal testimony of people's lives and journeys and introduce you to people who I think you're going to 
uh, really be grateful to hear from. I know I am grateful to hear from them. So in our first session, we have Joel Richardson, a dear friend of mine, who I think is one of the clearest voices out there today on the issue of the Middle East, and specifically the new Middle East, because Joel understands the old Middle East. And so I really appreciate his perspective and the way he carries it, because over the years, one of the things that I've seen with people who care about the Middle East or prophecy or this, this region or Israel, the conflicts, is it can be kind of kooky, fringe, sensational, speculative, weird. And I really appreciate Joel's uh, kind of, uh, in a sense, dry, <laughs> calm, level-headed, steady-handed approach to the whole thing. And so I think it, this is a really good place to start. What I want to do in the first session is kind of tee it up and ask you, Joel, to lay the landscape of, from your perspective. What do you think is the most significant seismic um, developments or changes or things that are taking place in the Middle East right now? Um, you know, you and I, for since I don't know what year it was, uh, we got connected, I think, in 2007, something like that. And then, you know, once the Arab Spring kicked off, pretty much every year, you and I have been visiting different parts of the Middle East together and exploring and learning and making films, writing books, uh, trying to understand it ourselves and trying to pull uh, the body of Christ globally into this great story of the Middle East. And so it's been a huge privilege to be able to traverse the region together. And I appreciate your eyes and how you see things. So with that, uh, let's lay the landscape for the next, you know, 20, 30 days or so. Paint, paint the picture. What are the biggest mountaintop peaks that are significant in, in contributing to what we could call the new Middle East? It's not the Middle East of the past. It's a brand new day. There's something significant taking place at this moment of history that's uh, a very, we are at a, a critical juncture and at a historical crossroads. So, um, and I think we all have different uh, handles on why that is based on our vantage point and where we're living and how we're experiencing it. So with that, what do you see happening? Yeah, it is interesting to look back. Uh, we're coming up here on at the end of 2020. And it was really in December of 2010 that the Arab Spring began. Um, you had Mohammed Bouaziz over there in uh, Tunisia. He was uh, abused or mistreated by some uh, police. He was a, a very uh, poor fruit vendor, and he was mistreated by some police. He lit himself on fire in protest and died a few weeks later. And this man became the spark that completely transformed the whole Middle East. Well, since then, there's been about three different seasons over the past decade where everyone said the entire Middle East is being completely transformed. You know, so th these type of statements, most often we would see them, you know, every every century. Now we're seeing tectonic transitions every couple of years, and this is all just within the past decade. Um, but I would say one of the primary ways or uh, frameworks that I am often looking at the Middle East in terms of the alignment, uh, the alignment of what I would see with ground reality with biblical prophecy. And I appreciate the fact that you said I'm not overly sensationalist. Um, I would see myself as cautious. <clears throat> and there's a, there's a little analogy that I always use, which is to say, if you carefully analyze the contours of the landscape um, of the last days as described by the biblical prophets. So let's say if you carefully analyze the biblical prophets, and you say they're painting a picture of the last days, they're, they're outlining the contours of this mountain range. And of course, mountain ranges are pretty complex. Um, all of the various valleys and peaks and so forth. But if you're to analyze the way they describe it, presently, the aligning of the nations, the, align, the geopolitical ground reality, that that contour as it's coming into uh, focus is significantly aligning with the description of the biblical prophets. And that's profound because it's, it is very specific. Now, when I say that, then the cautious side of me wants to qualify and say, but we're not quite there yet. Things are coming into alignment, but we need to be careful not to jump the gun and get overly um, apocalyptic, so to speak. There's, 
legitimate reasons to, to be paying attention, but I would say the primary framework or one of the primary passages that I use to define the framework of how I see the Middle East moving and where it is moving right now is Daniel chapter 11 and specifically verse 40. But Daniel chapter 11, the prophet lays out this uh, this prophecy which is about the last days, but he uses history as a pattern through which we who are living in the last days or in the latter days could interpret the constellation of the nations, the aligning of the nations. And so Daniel was using this historical conflict between the Seleucid dynasty in the north and the Ptolemaic dynasty in the south. So after Alexander the Great died, these various successors divided up his vast kingdom, which controlled the entire Middle East and a good part of Europe as well. And after a series of wars over about a 20 to 30 year period, you really had two primary dynasties that were controlling the, the majority of the Middle East. And that was the Seleucid dynasty in the north, which controlled, let's say, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, uh, northern Israel, or even much of Israel itself right where you're living. And then you had the Ptolemaic dynasty in the south, which was Egypt. So this becomes the primary paradigm that Daniel says, in the last days, this sort of pattern will be repeated. And the Seleucid dynasty, he refers to as the king of the north. And then the Ptolemaic is the king of the south. And of course, the king of the north is the Antichrist. And the king of the south is, yes, it's Egypt, but I believe it represents a uh, an alliance of various nations which are in conflict with this emerging Antichrist power base in the north. Okay, so this is what we're looking at is kind of a Turkish power in the north clashing with an Egyptian uh, alliance or power in the south. And so, again, since the Arab Spring over the past decade, we've seen massive transitions in power. And it's amazing the, the elasticity, so to speak, of the Middle East, that here was Daniel thousands of years ago. Um, so we're dealing with about 2,500 years ago. And the primary, uh, is the term locus, the primary locuses of power, uh, or loci of power in the Middle East, are snapping back to what they were 2,500 years ago to where once again, we're seeing Turkey emerge as a regional power. And again, Egypt as sort of the Southern power and they're in conflict. There's a term that um, historians use and they, they say geography is destiny. It's a pretty profound statement. <clears throat> and what that means is that oftentimes geography, we're talking natural landmarks, um, oceans, mountain ranges, uh, rivers. These things often, uh, not guarantee, but they often do lend to the fact that various historical uh, powers will be in conflict over and over and over again. This is why history repeats itself. But the funny thing is that that geography itself is not enough to, uh, to determine that these, these powers are going to be in conflict. There's much more that's happening. And so another, another sort of, uh, I won't say underlying, but overlying principle is also seen in Daniel, really chapter 10, which is where Daniel talks about the prince, the principalities of Persia, the principalities of Yavan or Greece. And so you've got, you've got a lot of various realities playing out layered on top of one another. You've got geography, you've got the elasticity of geography, you've got the elasticity of prophecy, and then you've got this principle of the principalities, these ancient spiritual or divine governing principalities. And all of these things are coming together. And so what we're seeing right now, I mean, summarized is we're seeing Turkey emerge as a regional power. Now, Geopolitically, in terms of, let's say, American foreign policy or Israeli foreign policy, 
the primary paradigm over the past 10 years is that Iran is the greatest regional existential threat. And there's no question that Iran is a profound player. But what I've been saying, what you've been saying, really for 15 years now, well over a decade, is that yes, Iran is a profound threat and an important player, but watch Turkey. Turkey has been the dark horse. They're emerging. Prophecy is clear. Ezekiel 38, 39 is clear. Various other passages in Zechariah, again, in Daniel, point to the emergence of Turkey as a regional threat, a regional player in the last days. And so once again, we could mention the Abraham Accords, the Abrahamic Accords, the Israeli Peace Plan. The, the nations are aligning. They're forming alliances and friendships and peace treaties and agreements, not just based on the threat of Iran, but also based on the emerging threat of Turkey and how the nations uh, relate to Turkey and they relate to Hamas. So on one hand, I'm gonna make this statement and then I'll turn it back to you. You've got Turkey, which is the regional parent of Hamas, of the Muslim Brotherhood. So you've got most of the primary players, they're actually living in Turkey, uh, Ismail Haniya, um, some of these different multi-billionaires that have been soaking up all of the funds for Hamas, but these are the leaders of Hamas. They've been living in Turkey. So you've got Turkey emerging as the mothership, so to speak, of the more radicals in the region. You've got nations like Qatar that will be aligning with Turkey. You've got, again, the, the Palestinian, the more radical side of the Palestinians aligning with Turkey. And then on the other hand, you have Israel. And with Israel, of course, we've got Egypt has this longstanding peace treaty. You've got, to a degree, Jordan. Um, and now you have the UAE, Bahrain. You've got a lot of other nations lining up. I believe we will see Saudi Arabia fall into that coalition in the future. But you've got the more radical nations, the more dangerous nations. Iran will be aligning with Turkey. And then on the other side, you have the more Western-friendly or Israel-friendly or what I'll call sheep nations, uh, Matthew 25, that are falling into alignment with Israel. And I think that's the primary paradigm that uh, is beginning to define the Middle East, is that king of the north, uh, Turkish sort of coalition versus the king of the south, the more Israel-friendly nations that are emerging. And I think that's, that's the way things are going to fall over the next couple years or the next several months. We don't really know timing. Things change drastically and overnight as we've seen this past year. But I'll just leave it there and uh, turn it back to you. But that's, I know that's complicated, but that's the primary paradigm through which I see things aligning right now. Yeah, well, I want to ask you maybe uh, some questions that are a bit more personal about your own story and journey with this. But on, on that note, I just want to read this. I know it's, it's going around on tw Twitter today. Um, this is a statement from, from Erdogan, president of Turkey, concerning Jerusalem. Uh, this is from the, their Grand National Assembly uh, in Turkey. It's, it's titled, Jerusalem is Our City. The issue of Jerusalem is not an ordinary geopolitical problem for us. Our ancestors showed their respect for centuries by keeping this city in high esteem. Jerus Jerusalem is our city, a city from us. <laughs> we consider it an honor on behalf of our country and nation to express the rights of the oppressed Palestinian people on every platform with whom we have lived for centuries. With this understanding, we will follow both the Palestinian cause, which is the bleeding wound of the global conscience, and the Jerusalem case or cause to the end. To the end. You know, I think all of us, <laughs> I bring that up to say that, you know, we care about the Middle East because, as Erdogan says so eloquently, the centrality of Jerusalem transcends geopolitics it transcends nationality here's a uh, uh, you know you go why you're saying this is your city why are you saying that this is your city it's this city is the vortex that's that has 
is and will pull everyone into before this thing is over. And I think it's not just about this. It's not just about Jerusalem, though, because Jerusalem touches every other issue in every other area. And I think for all of us, oh, looks like one of my boys got hurt. One of the one of the things that uh, it's just Judah, my littlest one. I think he's tough. You good, buddy? Okay, things are good. For you, Joel, the the journey. You know, I think people know people who track with you they know you as the you know the guy who loves the middle east and, and the bible and prophecy and missions and the, the muslim uh, expert guy like how for you on a personal level you know obviously we can we can talk in in other sessions we can get into more details of you know um, maybe the history and prophecy concerning you know you you just drop the big one the emerging the rising of turkey is one of the main main dynamics but apart from the geopolitical thing like for you what was the journey that um made you care because there's other parts of the world that are you know very consequential significant it's not as though the middle east is the only important place in the world but for you why is it something that has it's really marked your life i mean you wake up in the morning go to bed every night and your life is connected in some you know very intimate way to this part of the earth as a you know, a, a Southie from Boston, how, how did that, how did that happen on a personal level? Yeah. And I have to qualify that when you say Southie from Boston, the Southies get very upset because I wasn't technically from Southie. I, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned that I'm from South Boston and there was some guys on YouTube that actually got upset and they're like, I asked around and nobody recognizes him. That's how, uh, insular South Boston is. I'm from the South Shore of Massachusetts, so it's a little bit south of Southie. I don't want all the the, the uh, Boston Southie Mafia guys coming after me. But um, no, I came to faith, yeah, on the South Shore of Massachusetts in 1991, and it was within really just a few months that a missionary had come to my church, and in sort of typical Pentecostal fashion, but Pentecostal missionary fashion. He laid out the uh, reality concerning the 1040 window. He laid out the fact that at the time, 1991, half of the entire unreached world were Muslims. And we were sending less than half of 1% of our total global missionary Protestant force to the Muslim world. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. And uh, for me, it was very pragmatic. I mean, it, the spirit drew me, there's no question, but it was very pragmatic or very practical. I said, Lord, I should be dead right now. I really should be in hell right now, but you saved me. You intervened. You opened my eyes. And if this is where you need people, then sign me up. I had no idea what that meant. And so I knelt at the altar and I committed my life to the Islamic world. Well, skip forward uh, a couple years later, I had the opportunity to visit the Middle East. Somebody said, hey, I'm going to Israel. I'm going to work on a kibbutz. A uh, kibbutz up there in, in, in northern Galilee, which is not too far from you, kibbutz Machanaim. And, um, and I thought, hey, I have no idea what that is, but it sounds good. It was a good way for me to dip my toes in the Middle East. And so I spent uh, several weeks up there in the Galilee, and then I ended up canceling my return flight. And I spent most of 1994 just kind of bouncing around Israel, Egypt, Jordan, just a young guy with a backpack and, and a Bible and, and seeking out what this thing called the Middle East was and just listening to people and having tea and all kinds of adventures and getting in trouble and so forth. And so that was sort of my, my baptism into the Middle East. Of course, it was a very different Middle East back then. Um, that's that's when you could very easily just sort of shoot out with a backpack and not get in too much trouble. But the Lord was, was uh, indelibly branding me with his heart for the region and all of the complexities. And again, I didn't understand it. Um, I made numerous mistakes, not understanding, even at first, the difference between Israelis and, and uh, Arab Israelis, I mean, Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis and this type of thing. Um, but then the Lord brought me back. He brought me back to the Midwest, the United States. And, you know, I had a game plan was to get my education, move to the Middle East as a missionary. 
but instead he brought me back to the Midwest and life happened. You know, I met my wife, kids happen, marriage happens. And so I, you know, I live in Kansas now. I live in the heart of the United States, pretty far removed from the Middle East. But this, this branding that the Lord has had on me has never left. And of course, I've had many, many opportunities uh, over the past uh, decade plus to visit the Middle East, to spend time there. You and I have had quite a few adventures, and the Lord's really opened that up. Um, but it's an interesting paradox in that here I am living at ease in the coastland, so to speak, in, in Kansas. And yet my calling and my heart in so many ways is in the Middle East. And it's fascinating to hear Erdogan refer to the cause of Jerusalem, which is actually a statement right out of the scriptures, the controversy or the cause of Zion. And it's amazing when you hear world leaders inadvertently quote scripture, some of the most pivotal concepts in scripture, and to see them without realizing it, that they are, I don't want to say pawns, but they are tools in the hand of the Lord as his end time purposes are coming into alignment, coming into, uh, into focus. And whether he realizes it or not, he's under the sovereignty, the sovereign guidance of the Lord. And so my heart personally, in terms of my own journey is it started out missional. You know, it started out, I have a passion to see the gospel proclaimed throughout this region. I love the Middle East. Um, I always joke for those in the United States that don't like conflict. They don't like arguing. I go, look, I'm from Boston, which culturally speaking, compared to the rest of the United States, New York, Boston, we're like halfway to the Middle East. Compared to California, you know, they don't like negative vibes. They don't like discussing God, politics, or religion. You know, don't talk to me about politics or religion. Well, that's exactly what every conversation in the Middle East revolves around. And in New York, Boston, we're probably halfway there. So the messiness, the conflict, um, the complexity of the Middle East, I enjoy it. I, it's part of my DNA. It's part of my spiritual DNA. It's part of my sort of uh, cultural DNA. I enjoy the complexity of it all because it's in that mess. It's in that complexity. I personally believe that it's sort of like, and this might not be the best analogy, but it's like God's playground. It's God's amusement park. If you love being part of what God is doing and seeing God act and seeing God move, then the Middle East is like a playground. He, he's always active. There's always something happening. And really, that's, that's probably why I love it so much. I love being where I see God moving. And God is just constantly moving throughout the region. It is interesting, the, the storylines, how the Lord, you know, weaves interests, like why, you know, in his providence do you care about this or that, you know, just to, from a pure curiosity standpoint, you know, like, Lord, how, you know, this person wakes up and feels motivated and moved by this, this person wakes up and is, is motivated by this you know it's it's just fascinating and i think the middle east is something that i think it it's going to be the evangelistic magnet at the end of the age that the lord's going to use to to awaken i think for me you know looking at the the new middle east is my journey because i met the lord at 18 and started reading the Bible and was like, I, you know, I like you, Jesus, but the Bible's pretty weird. I'm, I'm not really into it. And I'm struggling with it. And I'm reading these very bizarre verses for a beach kid from Florida. It's like, this is, this is weird. You know, I started getting into it. I went to a Christian bookstore and I bought a, as you do when you're a new first generation Christian, you go to the bookstore and you pick out the book that has the coolest cover. 
So I picked out the the book that had the coolest cover that didn't have like flowers on it. The only one that didn't have like flowers and like feminine stuff on it. And I picked it up and it had a clock on it and it was something about the end of the age. And I was like, oh, interesting. So I bought it and went home and started reading it. And the first two chapters of the book were the author showing the contradictions within the synoptic gospels. Was chapter one and chapter two is how Jesus was a failed apocalyptic prophet. And then from there, he went into this hardcore leftist liberal deconstructionist thing about the end of the age and how it was, you know, uh, you know, basically all of our assumptions are wrong about the end of the age because you can't even trust the New Testament. And so I'm reading this. and I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's showing the, the contradictions in Matthew and Luke and Mark. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm believing a lie. And so that month I went into this deep crisis of faith where I was like, I can't trust the word. And if I can't trust that he's good, if I can't trust the word, I can't trust anything about his character, his nature. I can't trust him. If I can't trust him. I can't worship him. I can't love him. And so I was like, I don't really know what to do here. And I went to, so I went to some folks who were the only Christians I knew and asked them about it. And they didn't know anything about end times eschatology. So it was kind of, they were like, look, man, I don't know. You know, one of his big verses was from Matthew 24. No one knows the day or the hour. Da, da, da. And, then, and then he goes into the whole, you know, this generation by no means pass away. And look, they died. It passed. They, they passed away and he didn't come. So he's a liar, you know. And uh, so there's this deep crisis of faith. I'm asking people to help me with these verses. And people are like, I don't know. I've never read those verses, you know. And what it did was I was like, look, I'm either going to walk away from all of this because this is a cult and it's, it's weird. And it's a sham, the whole thing, it's a fraud. Or I actually need to read the Bible. And I, this guy is actually the crook and he's just trying to make money and sell books. So what I did was I decided I'm going to, I'm going to read this thing. I'm going to figure it out. And so I got into the, the major minor prophets and started reading the Old Testament. And as I did, I started to see the genius of the fabric of the prophetic and seeing that everything was wrapped around the Middle East, which was very offensive at first because I'm reading about all these places that it's like, I had no idea. I thought this thing, the book was all about Jesus, but he, I, I couldn't find him in there. You know, it's like everything is about the Middle East. And that doesn't mean that the Bible is not about Jesus. It is, but the context of the whole story that leads to our hearts being stolen by the man from Galilee, really this, this stage is set in a, in a Middle Eastern stage. So for me, the reason why the Middle East is, is so, mm, it means so much to me is because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have stuck with the Lord if it wasn't for the work that he did in me by studying the script, what the scriptures say about the Middle East. For me, it's not, it's not geopolitics. For me, it's not even prophecy or eschatology. It's the question of, is he trustworthy? Is his word true? Because if it's not true, then this, what's the point of any of this? It's all or nothing in terms of trustworthiness of his word. And it just so happens that so much of that comes down to the Middle East. And I started looking at it and seeing all of these events. I'm going, because here's really what I believe a bottom line about the, the Middle East is if you watch it with prophetic eyes, the right way, you actually love Jesus more every year because you're actually seeing the word become self vindicating more clearly every year. So it's not that I've had people that say, hey, no, I just want to love Jesus and not focus on the end times, not focus on Middle East geopolitics, stay out of the geopolitics and go, yeah, but it's God's story. And I think if we look at it with the right eyes, and that's why I'm, I'm excited for the, the next 20 or 30 days to jump into the, the story, because it's not just about who's the bad guy in the region right now and how can we build, you know, fanciful theories about why, you know, Erdogan's bad and we should be afraid of him. It, there, there's such, such, a, such a bigger context that's taking place right now. And ultimately, I think it's about the first commandment about moving all of us and arresting the attention of all the nations that we would all look, you know, I love the book of Ezekiel, the refrain, then the nations will know, then the nations will know. And how are they going to know? Because of what happens here in the Middle East, that's how they're going to know. And so it's God's vindication ground. And I think that's why it's so valuable. So we'll wrap this one up. Some of the sessions are going to be, you know, we're going to have, uh, some of them, these are going to be very geopolitical. Some of them are going to be much more Bible. We're going to kind of ebb and flow in and out of things. But l let me uh, close with a question for you, Joel, that's uh, maybe a call for people 
to to stick with this and to journey with this o- over the next month or so. Why do you think for someone who lives, who doesn't live over here, who doesn't have the quote unquote, a dog in the flight, they're not here. They're not raising their children in Afghanistan or Yemen or Libya or Lebanon. Why should the nations care, number one? And what do you think is a good posture of heart over the next month in, in jumping and journeying with us? What would you exhort people to do because I think people a lot of people that I meet want to go deeper in their understanding of what's taking place but it's really daunting and confusing kind of like the bible so they just don't I think having you know uh, someone who has gone through the journey and has you know paid a you know a a price for for doing that I think is, is really helpful for people who are on the front end of the journey of you know where you were at the beginning of wanting to go deep and, and find your own sense of assignment in all of this? You know, I think, I think you actually hit the nail on the head, which is to say, if you, even if you're someone who doesn't have an interest in the complexity of politics and religion and geopolitics in the Middle East and prophecy and all of these type of things, if you are a Christian, or Jew. I mean, if you are a student of the Bible in any way, student of the scriptures, the reality is this is, this is the center. This is the epicenter. And it's, it's profoundly validating. It's profoundly vindicating. It's actually, in a strange way, profoundly encouraging to see that the things that God said, very specific detailed um, issues and matters and and the the manner in which things would align are in fact taking place. You know, skip back 10 years ago, uh, I was writing about these things, some of the things that we just talked about, and I was referred to as as a crazy person. You know, Joel Richardson's a radical apocalyptic guy. He's saying, watch out for Turkey and all this type of thing. And it's kind of funny when you go back and look at some of the, um, the, the articles that were written about me, you know, Media Matters or Rachel Maddow one time made fun of me for 10, 15, a big segment of her program and, uh, and the language that they use. But now mainstream media, not just mainstream media, but Erdogan himself, you know, read, you know, global leaders are saying the very same things that I was saying 10 years ago. And it's not because I'm a prophet. And and this is the thing of it. It's because the scriptures said this, said these things. And so it, this is not an issue of, of me saying, I told you so it's an issue of God saying, guys, I told you beforehand. And so even if your heart has nothing to do with Jews or Muslims or the Middle East or Israel, maybe you have a calling to India or Iceland. The reality is this is vindicating and validating to everyone who is a follower of Jesus because his story, his homeland, um, and his future story, not just his past story, but his future story does revolve around this very specific piece of geography and the nations that surround Jerusalem. And so there is encouragement there. You know, as Paul says, when you see all of these things, lift up your heads. I'm sorry, not Paul, because your redemption draws nigh. So there is, a, there is a, an opportunity for all of us in the midst of 2020 to lift up our heads because our redemption is, is getting close I have some friends that we check in on one another every, uh, now and then and, and just say, hey, how are you doing? And, and one of the little statements that they often say is one day closer. Just remember, we're one day closer. We're, you know, that much closer to the day when we will no longer talk about him and just sing about him. We will see him. We will see him with our eyes on the ground in Jerusalem, in our bodies, in our glorified, resurrected bodies. And so... Ultimately, it's about encouragement. It's really about encouragement in this increasingly dark and wicked age, not to focus on pessimistic, negative, bad news, but it's actually to encourage our hearts because his 
not just his prophecies are true, but his plan of redemption is true. Um, if the nations are falling into alignment according to his word, then so also will Eden be restored according to his word. So also will the serpent be crushed according to his word. So also will the king return and be established on the throne according to his word. So to me, this is encouraging. It's actually encouraging stuff. I know we're getting to some of the nitty gritty details, um, but that's, that is how I see it. I want to just pitch it back to you before you wrap it up and, um, and sort of give you the opportunity to add on to that in terms of why you also see it as so critical. I mean, you live there. Um, you've lived there for the past, you've lived in Israel for the past few years, but you've lived in the Middle East for several years. Um, what did I miss? What would you want to tag on to that? Because I know there's, there's so much for so many. No, I think we've mowed over the grass we needed to in this session. I, I, I just feel the, the emphasis in these days is, you know, lift up your, like you're saying, lift up your head. It, it really is about trusting and loving the Lord more. That's what all this is about. And my hope is that as we go into this, that, you know, uh, for example, personal prophecy. If you've ever received a prophetic word from someone that is, you know, where the Lord reads your mail and it's like, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be like, you know, someone tells you your, you know, your favorite food or whatever, like, or, you know, someone tells you your address, something that only the Lord knows kind of that you had those prophetic moments if you've had those prophetic moments, you don't walk away from it caught up in the prophetic word. You know, you walk away from it in awe that he knows you and that he's real. Yes. And I remember that was the, for me, when prophecy first started to explode, I felt like I, I felt more loved. I felt his love more than I ha ever had. I felt like he was more clear, like who he was, his, his character, his nature, his attributes, what he's like was not a, not a muddy thing to me anymore. And I think that's the thing it, for me, the reason why we want to look at the middle East is to get steel in our spine and to have more fire in our hearts concerning who he is, that we could actually face, you know, the verse that I has been running through my mind that all 2020 is, is from Jeremiah 16. The, you know, you, you, you've run with the horsemen or you've run with the footmen and you're struggling to keep up. How are you going to run with the horsemen? Meaning these are days, this is the calmest it's going to be. <laughs> it's going to get more intense. And as it does, it's not just an issue of being prepared so that we don't fall away. It's not, that's not the issue. It's, it's being fierce in love, being strong in the knowledge of who he is. And I think that's, that's what I would, what I hope is accomplished through this uh, little limited series we're going to do over the next few weeks. I hope people come away with that experience of that, you know, the example of the prophetic word. We have something much more profound than a personal prophetic word where the Lord reads your mail. We have the creator of the universe who's already laid out how history culminates in vivid detail. And when we watch it, here's the crazy thing. When you watch the abomination of desolation go up in Jerusalem on that day, I don't think all of us are going to be thinking about the, the geopolitics of it all. I think we're going to be going, he's real. <laughs> he's real. We can trust him. We can lose our lives for him because he said that was going to happen. It did, which means John 316 is real. You know, if Daniel 1131 is real, then John 316 is real. And he, he loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And that means so much more when you actually believe it. And I think that's the thing about prophecy that I love and the Middle East that I love. It moves us. If we look at it the right way, it moves us deeper into relationship with Jesus, confidence before the Father, in a, an abiding relationship with the Holy Spirit because you're dependent every moment on him because you see the fluidity of what's taking place and you realize that life is a vapor and nothing, we don't have control of this life in this age and it, it, you relinquish control and you let the Lord lead. And I, I hope that that's, that's the posture of heart that I would exhort people as we go through these sessions is just look at it through those lens, not to understand academically the knowledge of good and evil about what's taking place, but to really feast on, on, on Jesus in the midst of it, the goodness of who he is and the wonder of who he is. So 
Bro, thank you for, for doing this, the inaugural episode. Um, I always love connecting with you, and it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting that people are uh, blessed to hear your story. So we'll, we will pick up. I know we need to cover a whole episode on Saudi Arabia. I think we need to do a whole episode on probably Turkey and go deeper into this, um, both those two things. So we'll, we'll talk more and, and tee up what we'll do in subsequent sessions over the next few weeks. But thank you for doing the inaugural inaugural episode love you and I'm grateful for you anything else you want to say before we wrap it up no amen and amen good start uh love you too appreciate it and look forward to doing a little bit of a deeper dive rock and roll well guys thank you for watching or listening to this again if you don't already have it go download the fai app it's available on all major app stores and if for whatever reason you know uh, FAI, but you don't know Joel, I want to encourage you to go to his website. If there are people who don't know about uh, Joel, go to his website, get his books. All your books are free now online, correct? Yes. Yeah, so all, your bo all his books are free, and he has a YouTube channel with tons of amazing videos, and there's a lot of resources on his website. And uh, from time to time, he travels and speaks. So go and look up Joel if you are not familiar with him. Joel's Trumpet. Bless you guys. Joel's Trumpet.com. That's actually how I got connected to you back in 2007. Someone passed me the link and I read your first book and I reached out over email and somehow we got connected. So it's a uh, good things happen through Joel's Trumpet.com. So go check it out guys. Thank you for watching Maranatha. I don't know if that.